Welcome back to the course Networks and Distributed Systems based on the textbook by Jim Carose and Keith Ross, Computer Networking, a Top-Down Approach, 6th Edition. We last discussed the organizational concept of layers, so we'll pick up where we left off. Now we're going to have this overview of uh, the area of network security. The Internet has become mission critical for many institutions today, including large and small companies, universities, and government agencies. Many individuals also rely on the Internet for many of their professional, social, and personal activities. Unfortunately, there are those who attempt to damage our Internet-connected computers, violate our privacy, and render inoperable the Internet services on which we depend. The field of network security is about how the criminals can attack computer networks and about how we can defend networks against those attacks, or better yet, design new architectures that are immune to such attacks in the first place. Given the frequency and the variety of existing attacks, as well as the threat of new and more destructive future attacks, network security has become a central topic in the field of computer networking, and I might suggest a very beneficial and lucrative specialty for you to consider for your own career. We attach devices to the Internet because we want to receive and send data to and from the Internet. This includes web pages, email messages, MP3s, telephone calls, live videos, search engine results, and so on. But unfortunately, along with the information we need may come malware that can also enter and infect our devices. Once malware infects our device, it can delete our files, install spyware that collects our private information, such as social security numbers, passwords, and keystrokes. Our compromised host may also be controlled in a network of thousands of similarly compromised devices, collectively known as a botnet. Botnets are used to control and leverage for spam email distribution and distributed denial of service attacks against targeted hosts. Much of the malware out there today is self-replicating. Once it infects one host, from that host it seeks entry into other hosts over the Internet. And from the newly infected host, it seeks entry into yet more hosts. In this manner, self-replicating malware can spread exponentially fast. Malware can spread in the form of a virus or a worm. Viruses or malware that require some form of user interaction to infect the user's device. The classic example is an email attachment containing malicious executable code. If a user receives and opens such a message, the user inadvertently runs the malware on the device. Typically, such email viruses are self-replicating. Once executed, the virus may send an additional message with identical malicious attachment to, for example, every recipient in the user's address book. Worms are malware that can enter a device without any explicit user interaction. For example, a user may be running a vulnerable network application to which an attacker may send malware. In some cases, without any user intervention, the application may accept the malware from the Internet and run it, creating a worm. The worm in the newly infected device then scans the Internet, searching for other hosts running the same vulnerable network application. When it finds other vulnerable hosts, it sends a copy of itself to those hosts. Today, malware is pervasive and costly to defend against. Criminals attack servers and network infrastructures. Another broad class of security threats are known as denial of service attacks. As the name suggests, a denial of service attack renders a network, host, or other piece of infrastructure unusable for legitimate users. 
Web servers, email servers, DNS servers, and institutional networks can all be subject to DOS attacks. Internet denial of service attacks are extremely common, with thousands of these attacks occurring every year. Most Internet DOS attacks fall into one of three categories. A vulnerability attack that involves sending a few well-crafted messages to a vulnerable application or operating system running on a targeted host. If the right sequence of packets is sent to a vulnerable application or operating system, the service can stop, or worse, the host can crash. Another form of deniability attack is bandwidth flooding. The attacker sends a deluge of packets to the targeted host, so many packets that the target's access links become, become clogged. This prevents legitimate packages from reaching the server. There's also a vulnerability attack called connection flooding. The attacker establishes a large number of half-open or fully open TCP connections to the targeted host. The host can become so bogged down with these bogus connections that it stops accepting legitimate connections. Recalling our delay and loss analysis discussion, it's evident that if the server has an access rate of a certain number of bits per second, then the attacker will need to send traffic at a rate of approximately the same rate to cause damage. If the server's access rate is very large, a single attack source may not be able to generate enough traffic to harm the server. Furthermore, if all the traffic emanates from a single source, an upstream router may be able to detect the attack and block all the traffic from that source before the attack gets near the server. In a distributed denial of service attack, the attacker controls multiple sources and has each source blast traffic at the target. With this approach, the aggregate traffic rate across all control sources needs to be approximately the server's access rate to cripple the service. Distributed denial of service attacks leveraging botnets with thousands of compromised hosts are a common occurrence today. Distributed denial of service attacks are much harder to detect and defend against than denial of service attacks from a single host. Many users today access the internet via wireless devices such as Wi-Fi connected laptops or handheld devices with cellular internet connections. While it is great to have internet access everywhere allowing great new applications for mobile users, it also creates a major security vulnerability by placing a passive receiver in the vicinity of the wireless transmitter. That receiver can obtain a copy of every packet that is transmitted. These packets can contain all kinds of sensitive information including passwords, social security numbers, trade secrets, and private personal messages. A passive receiver that records a copy of every package that flies by it is called a packet sniffer. Packet sniffing software is freely available at various websites and as commercial products. Because packet sniffers are so passive, that is, they do not inject packets into the channel, they're difficult to detect. When we send packets into a wireless channel, we must accept the possibility that someone may be recording copies of our packets. These packet sniffers are used also by IT departments themselves to aid in combating these criminals and to simply look for equipment failures that may be generating rogue packets. One of the best defenses against packet sniffing involves encryption. It's surprisingly easy to create a packet with an arbitrary source address, packet content, and destination address, and then transmit this handcrafted packet into the Internet, which will dutifully forward the packet to its destination. Imagine the unsuspecting Internet router that receives such a packet. Takes the phony source address as being truthful. For example, it could modify the router's forwarding table. 
The ability to inject packets into the internet with false source address is known as IP spoofing and is but one of many ways in which one user can masquerade as another. To solve this problem, we will need endpoint authentication, that is, a mechanism that will allow us to determine with certainty if a message originates from where we think it does. How did the Internet get to be so insecure in the first place? The answer is that the Internet was originally designed to be a model in which there is no need for security. It's based on the model a group of mutually trusting users attached to a transparent network. Many aspects of the original Internet architecture deeply reflect this notion of mutual trust. For example, the ability for one user to send a packet to any other user is the default rather than a request and granted capability. And the user identity is taken at a declared face value rather than being authenticated by default. But today's internet certainly does not involve mutually trusting users. However, today's users still need to communicate when they don't necessarily trust each other. They may wish to communicate anonymously, or they may communicate indirectly through third parties. They may distrust the hardware, software, and even the air through which they communicate. We now have many security-related challenges before us. We should seek defenses against sniffing, endpoint masquerading, man-in-the-middle attacks, distributed denial-of-service attacks, malware, and more. We should keep in mind that communication among mutually trusted users is the exception rather than the rule. Welcome to the world of modern computer networking. Well, now that concludes our overview of the course. In the next unit, we'll start getting specific about some of these issues. And we will begin, as the title of the book suggests, at the top with the application layer. So go ahead, stop now, take care of whatever assignment you may have, and at some point in the near future, come on back and start off on Unit 2.